Welcome to another episode of Foolproof Theology. My name is Chase Davis and I'm your host. It's great to be with you here again. Hey, if you're a new listener, you should go sign up on the Patreon. You can get early access to every episode on the Patreon. Go sign up there. I've got the link in the show notes for you today. On the show, we're going to be discussing, an, uh, I guess an interview it was, um, not an article. Normally discuss books and articles, but interview. I did a reaction, uh, uh, impromptu reaction video with Andrew Isker. I'll put a link to that from his podcast, Contra Mundum. We had a lot of fun with that, but I wanted to get Joe Rigney here on the show uh, to discuss this. He's up in Moscow, and what happened was Legan talked about the Moscow mood. This has been a discussion that's come, in, come up in my church from an article that uh, Young wrote on the Moscow mood, warning people about this. And so who better to talk to than someone in Moscow, Joe Rigney. Joe, thank you for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me. So this uh, interview was on the Room for Nuance podcast. Um, yeah. It was a clip from it. Um, me and Isker kind of he um, did the whole thing, uh, which was, there's a lot of content there, classical yeah. theism and uh, the reform movement, and all this kind of stuff. I'm actually going to have Brad Vermeulen on tomorrow to oh. talk about his yeah. book, um, which I listened to on the Ren podcast. Really fascinating sociological study because it seems like Joe's journey up to Bethlehem, which if you're a listener, we've talked about that before, was more self-conscious. And I mm -hmm. fell into the kind of young, restless, reformed world. But Legan, who was on the podcast, is a big name, uh, Chancellor, President, RT, Reformed Theological Seminary, RTS. He was a special mm -hmm. guest in 2018 at the Acts 29 Global Conference uh, that mm -hmm. Russell Moore was the headline speaker of. Um, neither of those men were part of the network, but they were invited to participate and be there. So I've watched Legan. He, uh, he said some things, um, and we can get into that um, yeah. you know, as we talk about it. But Joe, when you... Uh, when you heard this, I mean, he's talking about the Moscow mood, lobbing grenades yeah. indiscriminately, LARPers for Jesus. I guess that's you, a LARPer for, for Christ, and mm -hmm. uh, ultimately just immature. So that's who we have on the show, Joe Rigney, uh, a LARPer. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I wanted to get into, like, what, yeah. what, how can we think soberly about this? Um, yeah. How can we evaluate what he's saying? And what does it kind of reveal about things? So if you had a chance to respond to Legan, what might yeah. you say to Legan, Joe? Yeah, so it's interesting. So, like, one one thing is, uh, so Sean Demars, I don't know him personally, but I was at. He actually invited me to be on his on his show uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was going to be down in Alabama. He's in Alabama, um, but it didn't work out. We weren't able to make the schedule work. But he he was gracious enough to invite me and wanted to come. And, I, and he said we could talk about anything. And uh, and so he, obviously he he himself isn't uh, allergic to all things Moscow. If he was willing to have me on the show. Uh, and I know uh, Ligon and I've met a handful of times over the years uh, via Bethlehem Connections. You know, he'd be out there or we'd be at T4G or whatever it was. And so I know we've met a few times. We never had any sub, you know, deep substantive conversations, but it was always sort of friendly. Um, and so uh, when this came out, you know, I actually like the, the clip that circulated like last week. I heard this podcast like a month ago, whenever, whenever the whole thing first dropped and somebody pointed it out to me. And so I listened to it and was really kind of like actually surprised at at the way it went. Uh, and, and so as I, and I've now I've had like, this is the cold take. So it's like, okay, what, what's going on there? And so as I've thought about it, it's kind of like, what, what, what would I say if, if we were able to have this conversation, uh, with him in, in, in private so that there's no cameras, cause I don't, that I don't need the distraction of that, but just like, what would I actually want to ask him? And, and as I thought, like the, the thing that was most noticeable to me in the whole thing was the contrast as the interview unfolded. And, and it was a contrast that would like, it would just be really sharp back and forth. And so it was the contrast between like the way he talked about certain uh, folks that he's had disagreements with and the way that he talked about others. Like it was just a really, like it was, it was like night and day. So, you know, the, the whole thing was he's, the, the first part's talking about his disagreements with Keller. Um, you know, so Sean brings up like, yeah, you and Keller are both in the PCA, but you've been on kind of opposite sides of like women deacons and these different controversies. You've had to go toe to toe with Keller on the uh, floor of the general assembly talk about that and what was it was great because you know he's just talking about well kel and i yeah we disagreed but it was all charitable it was all um you know you don't have to agree with keller to appreciate his ministry you agree with him on everything to appreciate him um you know i'd rather have a debate with a friend uh than you know that i care about on issues that i care about rather than someone i don't like um, he was just really charitable despite their disagreements in their own denomination about various things, complementarity or whatever, um, but was really charitable and, and stressed that over and over again. And so then 
what was interesting is that you had that. And then he's, he's the same way about the classical theism discussion. Like it was very charitable about, you know, these are debates happening and Scott Swain's doing great work and, and all this sort of stuff, but it's, it's, this is, it's charitable. It's, it's gracious. And so what was interesting is then, then Sean, the host sets him up by saying, yeah, one of the things I've appreciated about you is that you, you got a backbone, you don't give an inch, um, but you're also very Catholic, you know, big, you know, big hearted. Uh, you're gracious, even with folks you disagree with, like we just talked about. So I want to get your take on this. What do you think about the Moscow mood? And then it was like a, a, a switch got flipped. And all of a sudden, there's no more charitable, well, we didn't agree to disagree, or they do this great or that great. Um, like when I thought about what he could have said there that I think would have been representative of his position and where he's different from, uh, from us out here. Um, it could have been something like, you know, appreciate those guys. You know, this is Kevin did this in his article. They've done great stuff on uh, education and family and and whatnot. But, uh, you know, appreciate them on these. But, uh, you know, uh, and there's a place for satire or whatever. But I think they go too far and they get kind of dumb or he could, he could have made any number of criticisms in that way. And then it, it would have been like, then we move on to the next question about Big Eva or whatever. But instead, he kind of begins to just unload. And then throughout the interview, he keeps coming back to it. It was like every other question, they asked about Big Eva and it came back to Moscow Mood. We ask him, he gets asked about theonomy. It comes back to, again, those type of people. And so it was like, and, and just the contrast was stark between certain opponents that he's able to sort of have charitable disagreements, represent them fairly, give them the benefit of the doubt. And then the Moscow Mood, which he manifestly, uh, was, was not. So that was the thing. So I think I, like if I was having a conversation with him, I would say, did you, do you feel that? Is that accurate? Um, is that what was going on? Is that there is a, in your mind, a stark contrast between these kind of disagreements and then your disagreements, uh, with, with Moscow. I think that's where I, I want to start with him. Do you feel a, a strong, a stronger dislike, distaste? Um, and then maybe tell me about what, where's that coming from? Why, why do certain opponents, get charity and then certain others absolutely do not. Yeah. Do you have some of this stuff? It might be helpful for the listener. Do you have some of the stuff he like uh, said in the interview yeah. kind of written out? Cause I, I'm just trying to remember uh, yeah. what so, he said. Yeah. And this, and this is where it got kind of ironic. I think this is, I, I would want to ask him this question of like, did you, do you feel the irony here of criticizing Moscow mood? You know, he said Kevin's article was a good warning uh, about the Moscow mood. And then he did things like, you know, uh, uh, that he kind of caricature, caricatured the Moscow mood. So, you know, how, you know, he, his question is, you know, how can I love this world that hates me? That's the pressing question for us today. And I'm like, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and he says, as opposed to, and then he's contrasting that with Moscow mood, how can I make the world hate me more? How, how can I demean them with every word I say? How can I drive them away from the gospel so that I can build my brand and my pride? And I'm sitting there going like, that's a pretty, that's a, that's a pretty stark caricature right there, right? Like that's not a, Hey, this is what they think they're doing. I think they're getting it wrong, but it's a, I'm going to caricature their position. You know, their vision for faithfulness is a food fight. Uh, you know, this is, you mentioned the LARPing thing, right? Some of these guys, they act tough online, they're LARPing, but you'd have them in a fetal position in three minutes. Uh, if they, if, if you had them in a room, uh, right. there was kind of like this dismissal, uh, at one point of like, um, you know, I wouldn't, you know, uh, these guys are, you know, incredibly immature. Um, I wouldn't let them disciple my cat. And, and each, each one of these kind of, there's like these little mic drop moments where he's, he knows he's slapping hard and he's getting laughs. Like Sean kind of chuckled at it, um, which I would too, if I was probably given that interview. Um, but he's just, but so you got caricature, mockery, dismissal. And then I think like the, the kind of cap it off was kind of the impugning of motives, the sort of this is a feat. This is feeding ego. It's feeding envy. It's driven by a desire to be important. Um, and then there, there's a, we've been desensitized. This was explicit. Like we, it, there's circles in evangelicalism that have been desensitized to a spirit of mocking and slander. And then he said, which brings us back to the Moscow mood. So he has that in mind Yeah. and mocking and slander have no place. I'm not even sure some of these guys are Christians. And so it's like, and now, now if I'm going to be real charitable with him, I'm going, okay, is he talking about me? Because you know, the, the, the question is about Moscow mood. That's Kevin's article targeted at Doug. They mentioned the fact that Kevin got returned, you know, incoming fire for it. Well, I wrote an article, a really long one, responding to Kevin, yeah. um, as did Jared, as did Doug, as did Toby. 
and then on done, done podcasts like this where we responded. And so it's like, that's Moscow mood. That's the question is about us. And then in the middle of that, it's like, some of these guys aren't even Christians. It's like, are you, you have me in mind. That's what I want to ask him. Like, are you talking about me? And I, I think honestly that Legan would say, Oh, Joe, no, absolutely not. I don't, I'm not thinking about you. I'm thinking about, and then I'm guessing like anonymous guys on the internet. Yeah. But this is what's interesting is that the criticism that he's making of Moscow, uh, the right out of the gate was they, you know, the faithfulness is indiscriminately lobbing grenades in all directions. Right. And I'm going, it's ironic to criticize indiscriminately lobbing, lobbing grenades grenade. while indiscriminately lobbing grenades. Like, I don't know exactly who you're talking about. I think you're talking about Doug. It's that's the most obvious example. That's Moscow mood. Right. Uh, and anybody attracted to it. But then he also takes shots at like the abolitionists, kind of abortion abolitionists out of nowhere, just kind of brings them up just to kind of slap them away. Right. Uh, those who are trying to recover reform political theology, he's like they're being childish and immature. Uh, and it's totally stupid to think that you could have a Christian government or whatever. So it's like he's like slapping all of these people in all directions and then is going, oh, some people think faithfulness means indiscriminately lobbing grenades. And I'm going do you not see the irony here? That's that's just what I would want to ask him. Like, do you right. see the irony of what you've just done in criticizing the use of mockery, caricature, um, misrepresentation, dismissal, impugning motives? You're criticizing that because that's what quote unquote Moscow does. Yeah. But then you're doing it. Like you're doing yeah. it to us. So which which is it basically? Right. Yeah, and it, this Moscow mood, it's been um, it's been a good uh, conversation starter with with people I pastor and with other people. Obviously, it's happening online a lot, but these things bleed over into pastoral life. I got uh, you know subtweeted the other day because I I ended up deleting the tweet. I did a physiognomy or physiognomy, whatever the post is called, where I compared yeah. like bird and wolf, and I was yeah. just asking the question: if it's not real, how do you explain this? Playful Twitter stuff, yeah, yeah. and I got. Yep. Plenty of hate for it. Ended up deleting it because yeah. I don't even know what that word necessarily means. I think it means revealing someone's character. But someone said, if this is the Moscow mood, count me out. Right. right. And I'm like, OK, like this is just a label people are assigning to anyone they disagree with that I guess isn't winsome, right. isn't nuanced. I, I, you know, it's become kind of a slur yep. and uh, you can redeem it. You know, we, we've we've yep. joked about calling ourselves the Boulder Bravado or something, some you know alliteration. <laughs> But it's like, it's just weird. And this, I experienced this personally in my own pastoral ministry, speaking with Acts 29 leaders, you know, they would constantly mm -hmm. say, we're Bible guys. And I'm like, great, let's talk about the Bible. Let's talk about all aspects. And if you want to run your play of, you know, urban centric missional church planning in the city, uh, you know, having worship leaders wear BLM shirts and, you know, dumping on conservative Christians, you want to run that play, run that play. Good luck. I'm going to run a different play. And mm -hmm. can we at least agree to disagree and mm -hmm. move on with our lives, hoping, hoping and believing the best. And it's like, no, we're going to just cut right. you out of the network indiscriminately. And like, it's just wild. I don't, where, where do you think yeah. this, it, it feels like duplicity. It feels like hypocrisy. Where, what do you think drives this? Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what was interesting is that at one point in the thing, you know, I think you, it, it may have been about the abolitionists. It may have been about the, you know, guys who can't disciple his cat um, because they're too immature. Um, and who want to be, you know, tough guys or whatever. Um, but he says, do these guys have no self-awareness? And that's kind of how I felt. It was like, do you, do you like, and, and, I, mean, and I mean it honestly, I, I'm not trying to dunk on him. You know, like I, I, in my head, I have in my head, okay, don't rebuke an older man, you know, but encourage him as you would a father. That's what I would, that's what I'd want to do is to actually sure. have that conversation in private, which was interesting too, because he actually talks about in, in, in the interview, how, you know, Keller never wanted to fight in public because Keller's not a polemicist. He, he's an apologist. He's an evangelist. He's always trying to think about unbelievers and his context and like remove barriers. So he never wanted to fight with other Christians in public, which I think is probably is, is kind of true. Like, I, I don't I don't recall Keller. R rarely did Keller engage in polemics that way. Like there was sort of subtextual polemics probably uh, in play that, you know, he's contrasting his way, which is the good way of doing it versus the bad way. So like there's certainly that. But but Keller wasn't really a polemicist, but he talked about like in private, you know, Keller and and uh, Ligon and Al Mohler and Mark Dever are like in these back rooms. And it's funny to say and then, yeah, Big Eva's not a thing, but like, OK, like that's what people mean is they mean that gathering that's having these conversations uh, and they're having these really intense debates over this stuff. 
And it's like, so if I'm, if I'm there, what would I want to do? I'd, I want to say, do you have the self-awareness to realize that you actually do believe in the use of mockery, caricature, and dismissal? Like you think it's a permissible and effective tool in the pastor theologian's tool belt. Um, and you do so for good reasons. Like, so the, the interesting thing about this is I actually don't have a problem with his use of the caricature, the mockery, and the dismissal. Like, I think I can disagree with him, but the fact that he chose those means to kind of dismiss Moscow is like, that's that's on the table. Like, that's the yeah. argument that we've made for years is that is one of the tools you can use. Right. But it's a weird thing for someone. It's like saying somebody going, I, I'm, a, um, I'm a carpenter, but I never use hammers. And then watching the guy hammer stuff. And you're like, but right. do you see that you're using the hammer right now do you see it? And it's like, he, right. he, I don't think he does, but, but it is. And then, and the other thing to, to your point is, you know, the point about different methods, because I think again, in his, in his own explanations, Ligon said, you know, there's, there's different, there's places for different things. He kind of uses a John the Baptist versus Jesus contrast as a kind of, you know, uh, biblical heuristic to say like, there's the good cop, the bad cop, right? John, I guess John the Baptist is the bad cop. Uh, who's just more like in your face, prophetic, um, you know, you may not have your brother's wife kind of thing. And Jesus is, is more indirect or, or whatever, which I don't think quite works, but I get what he's doing. He's like, there's different sure. ways of approaching. J Jesus actually does make this point when, when he says, um, you know, John came, uh, you didn't come eating and drinking and you said he had a demon. I came eating and drinking. You say I'm a drunkard and a glutton, you know, like we, you know, uh, we, we sang a dirge. You didn't mourn. You, you played the flute. You didn't dance. Like, it didn't, the type of music wasn't matter. You just don't like the message. So he has in his category for like different methods. And so I don't understand like, like you, why, why can't you say, yeah, they've got a different approach and that's not the approach I would use. I don't think it's going to be as effective. Or I don't think it's as wise, or I even think some of it's unbiblical, but it's a different approach. That's fine. It's like that yeah. it can't be left there. It has to be no. kind of like, that has to be off the table while actually using the means that you're criticizing. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's the odd thing. And that's where I would want to probe. And I think I would contrast it uh, in some ways. You know, one of the things I learned in my years at Bethlehem, um, because Piper, uh, Piper has his disagreements, strong disagreements with Moscow mood. Like he doesn't, he doesn't uh, appreciate lots of it. And, and I think his, has that, that um, disapproval has grown over the years. He's, he's more concerned now than I'd say he was a decade ago. Um, when we were still, you know, when I was, I, I would, um, we'd, at the conference, you know, J John on one side, Doug on the other, and I'm, I'm pitching questions about precisely these differences. I think John's grown in his concern about this, but the thing that John also always wanted to do was we had to try to represent his opponents in a recognizable way, right? Like that they would say, oh yeah, I see, I see my, yep, you've, you've described my position accurately. Um, and there is a place for the caricature where they would say, that's not true. Um, but there's also, especially when you're dealing with fellow Christians, I think you want to represent them in such a way that they go, yeah, I recognize myself in that. And so listening to this and him describe sort of Moscow mood and put words and mentalities and mindsets in our mouths, it was like, I don't, don't recognize us in that. Like, how can we do everything to make the world hate us? How can we drive them away from the gospel? It's like, right. do you really think that that's, that we, that I come to work every day? Like Doug's right around the corner right now. Like, do you think we come in? thinking, how can we drive all of the unbelievers away in order to build our brand? Right. And it's like, I, I guess that's what he thinks about us. Um, it's coming out. He's saying it in an interview. Uh, and I just want to go, I, I kind of want to press and just say, do you really? And then, and then I don't know if he said yes. I don't know where the, I guess, okay, I guess the conversation's <laughs> over now because that's not true. Um, but, but it is, it is this really bizarre, bizarre thing uh, that, that it, it is that strong and it needs to be slapped down that hard. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to the, there's two things. And I want to hear your, your perspective on big Eva, because in the conversation, he just flat out denies it's a thing. And I want to talk about that, but first, you know, it's, it's always ironic. And I think I've mentioned on the show before when the people who have these big platforms, they've obviously worked really hard. They're very talented. They have charisma, whatever it may be, whether they've developed a social network or a pedigree or degrees or whatever it may be. And they have, they have the platform and then they look at, anybody else who's trying to start a platform or just getting into it or anything like that. And they, they assume the worst motives. And I can't tell you how many times I heard this from stages at church conferences yeah. where these guys who, who will go on cruises to promote their latest book 
And then they get up at the church conference and they look at the guy uh, like me who may start a podcast and they go, you're just full of pride and ambition because you want to yeah. start something. And it's like, yep. that's weird, man. Like, that's really yeah. weird. And then that bleeds into kind of the Big Eva mindset in my mind, because when yep. I, at least when I talk about Big Eva, and I've had to explain this to people uh, that I interact with, I'm, we're, we're talking about an kind of evangelical industrial complex of, of uh, networks and social status and people that are very well connected. Crossway, TGC, uh, IVP, all these publishing companies, the colleges, the seminaries, and the, the parachurch ministries. And then they partner with churches. I mean, you look at, for example, Crossway, which this isn't, if you've published with Crossway, it's not to negatively necessarily talk about anything like that. But when a book comes out, you would get, sometimes you get a book advance, you get advance. And part of the deal is they're going to promote your work at these conferences. Mm -hmm. And so the conference circuit itself becomes like this machine where you've got to go on tour and you've got to promote your work. And, and, and like right. you said, with these meetings that they're having with Dever, I mean, you're talking about Nine Marks, Southern Baptist, uh, if Keller was there, you've got Redeemer Network, you've got Legan from RTS meeting together. These are powerful people. And again, that's not wrong. Uh, right. But they're, they were having meetings behind closed doors. Again, not wrong. Uh, but then right. to pretend like that's not that's not happening. It's not a reality. And there's not a a uh, a way they're saying discourse is allowed within these rails. And if you venture yeah. outside these rails, you're you're not permitted anymore. What do you what do you make of that? Yeah, so I think I think part of what it is is like big Eva, so you know big Eva, and when you talk about evangelical industrial complex, which I know this is like the Carl Truman thing, um, you know he kind of really popularized that probably eight ten years ago uh, way of talking, and it's like I think when when guys like Legan react and say that's it's just ridiculous, I don't pay it any mind, um, I think it's because from the outside that's how that's how it's sort of perceived or experienced or that's that okay that's what it is. From the inside, it's just these guys are friends. It actually isn't. I, I don't like having, you know, been somewhat adjacent to that sort of stuff when I in my time at Bethlehem. Um, and even here, like it it operates. It's just these are groups of people who are friends, who trust each other, and therefore who trust each other's judgment. And so if at one of those dinner conversations, somebody brings up, hey, anybody know anything about this guy? And one of them goes, yeah, he's trouble. It's like, well, like if, if I'm having dinner with my friends, and I bring up somebody that I don't know anything about and what somebody I trust says that guy's trouble. Like, well, I'm, I'm going to take that into account and probably be more wary. Or if they say, Oh, he's great. And they yeah. give the endorsement. I'm going to be like, okay, cool. I'm going to invite him to speak. Um, and, and so like, that's how, like, that's just human. Like it's, it is just human. It's just like, this is how we work. And there is a dynamic of like friendships from the outside look like inner rings to everybody, <laughs> you know, like, because they're yeah. kind of exclusive and not everybody gets to be in that room. And so like my whole thing on this is, is like, I like, like what you said, like th not, there's nothing wrong with this. This is just part of how life is. Um, and it does, but it does by sort of default, then establish ranges of acceptable opinions and can be, uh, and, and, and ought to be at some level, like used to like everybody polices, everybody, um, polices ranks, everybody polices sort of range of acceptable opinion. Like there are going to be boundaries. And, um, and so I think when, when it's criticized, I think, uh, the criticism sounds to those on the inside, like you're saying that there's these secret backroom meetings where everybody's plotting and everything else. And they know that's not true. Instead, it, if, if, instead, if you phrase it as a group of friends got together to plan stuff yeah, and it's like, well, that happened. And it's like, yeah. yeah. And so the result of that planning was certain people are going to get invited. Certain people aren't certain books are going to get promoted. Certain books aren't. Right. And, and there is like, and, and so that's just, and so, I, so at some level, I don't, um, I, I usually don't go in for like the big Eva criticism because I just think this is just normal human stuff and sure. that, and so criticizing normal human stuff isn't the issue. Instead, it's, uh, how do you, you know, ign at, if, if the, if you're outside the range of acceptable, right, if you're now on the other side of the line, then it's like, well, just keep doing what you're doing. Trust the Lord and, and don't let the discouragement that might come. Cause I, I do agree with you on the, the piece of the guys who get the platform and then immediately turn around and criticize. And I, this is another place where I always appreciated Piper uh, because one of the things he would always say to our seminary guys was you ought to want to build your platform because you have a message that people need to hear. Like, mm. like, like we, you know, the Bethlehem mantra was we exist to spread. So it's like, you ought to be trying to find ways to spread. Now there's dangers 
And so he would, you know, you always got to worry about the dangers, right? There's dangers of ego. There's dangers of amb- uh, the wrong kind of ungodly ambition. Right. All of that's there. But like as a baseline reality, we have a message and we want people to hear it. And so we ought to give thought to how do we maximize that? And, and then there's faithful ways to do it unfaithful. But he was always, he, he never was the sort, Piper was never the guy that said, hey, don't try to build something uh, in order to get your message out. It was spread it, spread it. Yeah. Uh, and so I always appreciate about him, but I know what you're talking about when the guys get up there and you're going, dude, you have a book, or you have a couple of books, you got publishers who are promoting your stuff. You've got a whole team of social media people. And now you're looking at the rest of us who are trying to do it, hustle on our own and going like, hey, watch out for your ambition. And it's like, ah, that ain't it. That ain't no. it. No. No, it kind of misses the mark. And I like what you, the inner ring has always perplexed me. And, and it's just a, a human experience. And Lewis has obviously written on this. But, yeah, um, you know, I think a lot of young men who enter ministry, they see these kind of inner rings. They see who's promoted. They see who's kind of plastered on social media or gets permission to write. And, you know, a lot of my friends will dunk on me because they're like, you know, back in the day, you would have loved to write for the Gospel Coalition. And now you don't want to touch them. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, like, that's. I think that's the right. way that men particularly are driven. They're, they're, they're attracted to those inner rings. The danger for anyone's heart is, you know, what, what goes on in your emotional world if you right. get to meet that person or get invited, you know, is yep. it? And I think that's uh, uh, something God humbled me in. Um, and it's a process of humbling, of course. But like at, at this point, I think my most excited guest I had on the podcast that I was excited for was John Frame. Um, uh-huh. But even then it was like he <laughs> you, got on the you podcast. Were yeah, he was fanboy pretty hard. Yeah. Was fanboy. But you know, he's got his phone going off during the interview, and and and, yeah. and it's just funny. And um, you know, a lot of my friends talk about like all of our heroes are dead. Like quite literally, we only want to talk about old dead guys uh, because right. like we're we're jaded and we're cynical in some ways from the machine. And it's like yeah. I'm really just not that impressed with the the glamour and the gloss. So I mean, cri- the the weird thing is a lot of young Christian men, particularly reformed young Christian men, are attracted to these things. Because they think it's cool. That was a young wrestler's reform stuff. And then yeah. you get into it and it's like, it's not that cool, man. And the yeah. fact that we think it's cool is kind of odd. Like it, these are not, it's not cool. It's, it's a vibe, I guess. But um, yeah, but yeah, the, well, the inner ring is where, a weird thing. Yeah. So that's, and that's where like Lewis would, you know, so if you read inner ring and then you read four loves where he talks about friendship and you can kind of compare them um, because friendship is, is uh, friendships built on common enterprise and common, common interest. So you, yeah, you, you, it's Lewis says, if you, you, you have a friend, you, you make a friend the first time you look at someone and you go, wait, you too, you like that too. You're into that too. Um, that's, that's friendship. Just got, yeah, that's the, that's the seed of friendship. Um, so it's not just doing the same thing, but it's like doing the same thing for the same reasons, pursuing the same thing, the same way, something like that. That's the shoulder to shoulder. And therefore Lewis says it's, it's, uh, it's exclusive, but it's exclusive accidentally. Like that's not the point. The point is not everybody likes the same stuff. Not everybody's into the same stuff. Uh, and so that's okay. But it's like, because you are, that kind of creates a little cocoon. Like you guys are in your own yeah. world. Like the, 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 the four or five of you that like that thing are now a club. And from the outside, people go, oh, it's, we're, we're out. We're not included. And so they can be, they can chafe at that when the exclusion is accidental. And if they develop the interest, they could be welcomed in like, hey, y'all come. You, you want to come and talk about this? We, we, you come and talk. Come in. We, we want, let's do it. Um, and so oftentimes the, the, the diagnostic there is, do you want to be in the room because you want to do the work? Or do you want to be in the room just to be in the room? Yeah. Right. This was, this was sort of and uh, because that's the, the inner ring is when friendship sort of the thing that the friendship becomes about, like what's the common interest is exclusion. Mm. it's when the point like it's not accidental it's essential now now the only thing that we're about is making sure we police the boundaries and keep Mm. some in and some out um and that that's kind of what we enjoy doing is is uh letting some in and then kicking others out and if that happens now you have a real inner ring and if you're just wanting to be in for that reason you'll get all the way in and it's hollow because it's like an onion you peel through every layer and you get to the middle and there's nothing yeah and uh and so the difference though is if you're interested in the work if you want to do the labor um, then you'll find yourself in something like an inner ring, but it's the kind of inner ring that doesn't care about the exclusivity and just wants to get the work done. Um, and yeah. I think, and, and so I, and I think for some of the, the guys, even in the big Eva, like they, they, they genuinely are that they have a job that they want to do. They have, they have a calling, they have a mission and they're collaborating together. Um, uh, but I don't think that they, again, this is where the self-awareness comes back to, to Ligon is, is 
do you recognize that you are actually policing? So in, in his, in the interview, it's very clear that he's setting himself in that kind of classic third way mode where he's, you know, if there's people on the left who are, you know, worldly influences from the left, worldly influences from the right, but I just want to be a Bible guy with sound theology and I want to go cool. Amen. Me too. Um, but then it's like, but then the policing happens really hard. And you asked like what I, what, what I thought is underneath it. And so this is where, I don't know, this would be, I'd maybe ask questions if I was in a room with him. Um, this is, it's more speculative, but I think that the reason that the, the slap down comes so hard on the Moscow mood in the way it did in that interview is, is actually in order to prevent any kind of face to face interaction from happening. That was the kind of fresh insight in listening to it. And the reason I say that is because when he described his disagreements with Keller, it was talking about the friendship and the affection and Keller just loved the gospel. He talked about Vern Poitras just loves the gospel and all of these guys who he might have disagreements on in various ways, but he recognized because of that personal relationship, a kind of like, they love Jesus. I love Jesus. And so now that's the context. Now we can have our disagreements about women deacons or classical theism or whatever. Uh, but the face to face sort of mitigates it. And I think at this point, M Moscow is, is like outside the, outside the bounds that if they're, if they ever were to kind of humanize Doug for lack of a better word, like it would really be disruptive. Yeah. And so, and so I'm listening to try and trying to figure out he's charitable to some opponents. He's very uncharitable to other opponents. What's the, what makes the difference? And it felt like it's like, which, which groups does he want to be able to share stages and platforms? And, and I don't mean that in a bad way, just like who right. does he want to partner with going forward? Yep. And it's like, he went, he would, he'd be open to partnering with Kellerites guys mm -hmm. who love Keller. He's like, he's signaling to them. Hey, I love Keller too. We disagreed, but we can work together. Uh, when it comes to the classical theist discussion, he's like, we, there's room for partnership here. Um, but then when it comes to Moscow, it's like, absolutely not. And so I need to dismiss mock caricature in order to make, in order to prevent it. And I think, you know, Doug in his response article earlier this week noted that like back some of, some of what's underneath this is actually like the federal vision stuff from back in the day that is sort of like underneath runs underneath. And it was all in, in and of itself really gnarly because, you know, there was lots of false accusations there. Uh, but it was like in the middle of that, Doug, was going to be in, in uh, Jackson where Ligon is. And there's all this controversy. What is this even about? And so they reached out to say, Hey, can we get together in private and just talk this through? And the invitation was declined. And it's like, well, once you've declined it and said, we well, are not worth talking to, it's really mm. hard to undo that and like open that door back up because it would require admitting that what you did before was probably not quite just. Right. Um, and, it, and the risk you run is that you might actually realize, oh, we've we've been saying things about this person that, that are false. Yeah. Uh, we actually have more agreement than we want to admit. And it's like we can't go there. And so it's, so you just got to kind of keep it at arm's length. And that's why you get the ominous overtones of like, you know, so it, there's a little throwaway in, the, in that interview where he's like underneath all of this is is issues of theology and, and the church and fidelity. And then he doesn't elaborate. Hmm. And all that does is signal to people who trust Ligon, don't even go there. Yeah. And he doesn't have to explain it because it's it's an appeal to ethos. It's like, do you trust, do you trust him? And if you do, you're gonna go, well, if Ligon says that there's you know really bad theological, ecclesiological, and faithfulness error under here, then I don't even I don't even need to go explore it for myself. Uh, and so I think that that's kind of the the underlying motive is at this point the stiff arm has been going on so long that it has to be maintained um, at all costs. That would be my space. So again, if I'm in the room with him, I'm saying, that's what I think is going on. Does that sound right? And I'd be curious to hear what he said in response. But the funny thing about all of this is this is the precise conversation that none of these guys have wanted to have. They don't no. in public or in private. Like it's, it's really a yeah. remarkable thing to say, Hey, we don't have to have cameras. We're not going to show, there's no showboating for anybody. We don't even have to tell anybody about it. And right. it's like, and so you go, why would somebody refuse that? Like, we'll fly you out here on our dime. We'll put you up. We'll invite you to a Sabbath meal. It'll be great. And it's like, still no. It's yeah. big enough that we're going to lob grenades at it, but it's yeah. not big enough to have the conversation uh, in person and, and everything. You go, why not? It's like, because I think if it was humanized and if like the brotherhood was identified that like 
like Ligon may want to think that we're not Christians or that some of us aren't Christians or whatever he actually meant by that. But like, I think he is <laughs> like, like, I right. think he's a brother. I think he's actually, you know, he's, he's a good preacher. Um, he's done good work in the PCA. I'm grateful for his ministry. So I actually think like he's in, I think a lot of these guys who don't like us are in, like, I'm like, I'm on your team, even if you're not going to be on ours. And I'm happy that you're doing it your way, even if you don't like our way at all. Yeah. Um, but if, but for them to admit the, the reverse, like if they had to come here, I think it would be, oh no, that would become clear. And once it became clear, then it would in, have certain entailments and obligations. They would have to then treat us like brothers. Yeah. And like right now, they don't really want to treat us like brothers. Yeah. And that's, it, there is a, there's a, a trail we could chase, a rabbit trail on friend enemy distinction dynamics <laughs> right. playing that's out that's amongst right. all of this social stuff. But, um, you know, I think Wilson a few years ago, because there were several paradigms um, or kind of taxonomies is what they're called, right? Where you list out, we're, what are the four camps? What are the six yeah, way yeah. fracturing? All this kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. And, Kevin, and yeah. they can be interesting, but uh, in my church, they've honestly caused more division than anything because uh, people would use that against me hmm. and uh, not a lot, but just a couple where it's like, well, you're this. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. Like, what are we talking about? But what Doug highlighted, and I think it was Doug highlighted in one of those is like, uh, Doug would happily have the young out to talk at Moscow right. or anything like that. But Doug would, that invitation would never be reciprocated. Right. And why is that? And that, that haunts me because I don't want to be that way. Uh, right. If it's a Christian brother, I still want to disagree where I disagree. I'm not going to like, you know, hide that, that, you know, we disagree on these matters or something like that. But if it's an interesting conversation that can contribute to the kingdom um, and the, the knowledge of God and understanding it, uh, it would just be interesting to explore. But these guys rarely will, will have a reciprocity. It's, it's very much a, we're writing you off. One of the most notorious people that practices this friend enemy distinction is Russell Moore. Oh. And, and he came up and talked, uh, and you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah. My, fr my friends could dunk on me all day long on Russell Moore because I got a picture at that conference with him signing my his book onward. And I was like, this guy's the best, you know, and I uh, I got a lot of trouble when I, you know, in the last few years kind of like said, I, I, I don't I think, think we should listen to him. You uh, should you should tweet that picture. I would, I would like that picture. <laughs> I bet you would. I would like that a lot. Back in the uh, day. <laughs> let's answer. Yes. Here's the, here's the funny thing is that like, um, I'll just say this. Um, we, I would extend the invitation to Russell Moore to come to Moscow and we'd let him speak at a disputatio and have a nice rousing discussion. We do it publicly. He could come if he wanted to talk quietly, uh, you know, privately or whatever with nobody knowing, like all of that's on the table. Like even, even it's like even Russell Moore. Um, and I think we, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there was at one point when like Rod Dreher criticized yes. us last fall or something and, and we extended the invitation to him and a bunch of guys were like, you're going to platform this divorced, you know, Eastern Orthodox guy. And it's like, you have to understand that like, that's not how we think about it out here. Like, it's like, we're not saying, Hey, Rod is awesome. We're saying Rod matters in terms of he's got influence. He has, he, he, people listen to him. And so let's engage. We're not, we're not afraid of the engagement and we don't take all engagement as endorsement. And I think right. that's some of like, the, there's a little bit of a mentality there is if you think of all like dignifying, if, if, engaging with someone and there, there's truth to this like engaging with someone does kind of dignify it it does sort of lend credibility like this this is a position worth taking account of right and uh and there are certain ones that you don't want to legitimize in that way like i get that in fact i think this is some of you know even as in, in recent days the whole you know christ is king and yes and some of the nick fuentes kind of discussion about the co-opting of biblical phrases um by unsavory characters and it's like responding to it elevates it dignifies it like yeah. if you don't you know, and and at some point you may have to because it gets influential enough but if it's not an influential thing in your circle you don't feel like you need to slap every error down just because everybody says you must and because he says christ is king and so do you instead it's just like keep doing what you're doing right like i, I maybe here's actually a good example I've, I've thought about writing an article on this at some point um but there's this moment uh, uh in acts you know, this is this came this came out of the recent leadership book because I do this extended deal on Acts twenty one to twenty four where Paul's going back to Jerusalem, and there's one part that I didn't really comment on, um, and it's when but it, and it's related to this because it's uh, Paul get, you know he's getting beat up the Roman Tribune comes and arrests him and every in crowds shouting contradictory accusations it's a big mob confusion chaos whatever 
Tribune hauls him back into the barracks and is like, what's the deal? And Paul, Paul speaks to him in Greek. And, uh, and the guy says, oh, you speak Greek? Aren't you that Egyptian uh, who led like 4,000 men of the assassins into the wilderness and like rebelled against the government? And then, so here's, here's a good example. Like Paul is being, mist- Paul, because he speaks Greek, because of what he says, because of how he sounds, is being mistaken for like an Egyptian terrorist. Right. Okay. And Paul's response is not panic, like, oh, no, no, don't, don't, don't confuse us with them. Instead, he's like, uh, I'm just a Jew from Tarsus, citizen of no obscure city. Uh, can I go speak to the people? Like, he just calmly says, no, that's not me. And he's like, back on mission. I've got something right. I want to say to that crowd. He doesn't waste his time trying to differentiate himself from Egyptian assassins. Yep. Like, he's willing to do it when he's asked explicitly, hey, are you that thing? To, to someone in this situation, he's like, hey, are you that? And he's like, no, back on message. Yep. He's not going to get bogged down in ritual denunciations of all of the bad, you know, religious sects in the Roman Empire, because that would be dumb. That would be de- he's getting steered and sabotaged. And yep. so instead, he's just like, no, I'm a Jew from Tarsus. Got a message. Can I talk to him? And then it's funny that he's he spoke Greek to him. He walks outside to that crowd and he's like speaking flawless Hebrew, which gets them to, you know, oh, that's a surprise. So. Interesting, like how the Bible, like the number of times, maybe the other way to say this is the number of times in the book of Acts, just track them, read through it, that Paul and the apostles, that there's a a mistaken identity. Like they're like, this guy's a God. This is Zeus and Hermes come down from heaven. Or these guys are like that, you know, Thutis rose up and gathered many men to himself. And then he was killed and his followers were scattered. Gamaliel does that, right? So it's like, everybody's got a bucket for these Christians. And they're constantly imposing it. And the Christians don't care. Yeah. Right. The only t- the, the one time where they do care is when they start trying to worship them. You know, <laughs> so it's like like when they start trying to sacrifice a bull to Paul, he's like, stop it. No. And yeah. then he really. No, 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 brothers. Um, yeah. And he barely he barely keeps it, keeps it, keeps him from doing it. Um, and then in the next chapter, right after the next verse, there's some Jews from uh, Antioch come down to that same crowd and stir him up. And they try to and they stone Paul almost to death. So it's like that. That went, that swung pretty hard. You're, you're a God yeah. and then you're getting stoned. But like, they don't care that they're, that people are going to be confused uh, about who they are, what their motives are, what their message is. They're just going to use the opportunity to say what they have to say. Yeah. And I think that there's a way in which like, so I, I would look at inviting a Russ Moore out here as like, all right, let's let Russ have a say. And then we're going to criticize and we'll disagree and whatever. And that will bring clarity. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's ironic because, you know, Again, uh, last I think it was last week, Russ Moore wrote an article about why character has fallen off among evangelicals because of Trump. And in it, he takes just, you know, he's got to do it, taking a little swipe at Doug for writing a um, creepy, uh, coarse, creepy robot sex novel referring to Ride Sally Ride. And I remember when I saw that, I thought it was hilarious because, um, particularly coming from, from Russ Moore, because back in the day when he was teaching at Southern, he uh, he had this every year he would teach his ethics class. And the final exam was always this like epic exam because he would give this like crazy outlandish scenario of like some ethical dilemma that nobody's ever thought of. And then the task was the students had to sort of bring to bear what they learned in the class to like d- deliver it. So back in 2011, he was talking about what do you do if John shows up at your church and he's repented and wants to believe the gospel. But then as you interview him, you realize, Oh, John was actually born Joan or maybe it's vice versa, whatever way it's like, Oh no, this is a transgender person presenting is the opposite. And now it's like, how do you, how do you deal with this? And like in 2011, that was like, Whoa, that's crazy. Now we're like, Oh, that's a thing. We we got to, everybody need that needs to be in, in the curriculum. So he's doing that kind of thing. The funny thing about the criticism of ride, Sally ride Doug's novel, that the, the premise is, uh, sex bob, sex robots are a thing. The United States has fractured into like regional, um, great, g- the great sort has happened. And there are certain regions that are super progressive and super regions that aren't. And then the super progressive one, a Christian kid takes his neighbor's sex robot who he's married to. He's married his sex robot. And he takes that sex robot and throws it in the trash compactor. And, and then he's tried for murder right. because the DA is like, oh, we can get this guy for murder. He killed the man's wife. And then the not, that's sort of the premise of the novel. And then there's a lot of other stuff happening. So that's what he's criticizing. Well, back in the day, one of these exam questions that Russ Moore came up with was this. It's, and I don't know if I have the details right, but it was something like years 2050, um, we're colonizing Mars. 
Um, and you got an astronaut in your congregation who's about to go do his, his tour of duty or whatever, and he's going to be gone for like three years. And he's concerned about his sexual fidelity, being away from his wife for so long. He doesn't want to look at porn. He doesn't want to cheat on her with any of the other lady astronauts. And so he and his wife get together, and the text developed to the point where you can have a sex robot made who looks like a particular person. And so they're going to have a sex robot made to look like his wife. Wow. It's going to be very realistic, uh, but it'll be, but it'll be look like his wife. And they're both on board with this. And he's going to take the robot with him to Mars. So for the three years, he can have sex with the robot. And that way he won't be tempted to sin with other people or look at porn. Wow. So it's like, a it's like this crazy like scenario, right? Yeah. And it's like, what kind of creepy person comes up with a scenario like that? But it's actually like an interesting thought experiment. And I'm like, I think Doug could probably write a novel about that. And he did. And he did, right? And so, it's like, so like it's, it's interesting for, for Moore to make that critic. It's, it's again, it's the same thing. It's like Legan Duncan criticizing mockery and dismissal and caricature while mocking and criticizing and caricaturing. Russ yeah. Moore criticizing, you know, a, a novel about that the, the premise has to do with a sex robot after he's written these elaborate scenarios about sex robots on Mars. Um, it's just this bizarre inconsistency. And it's, again, one of those things that if we ever could get in a room, I'd want to ask, because I, I, I think I'm a curious person, and I really would want to know what, what is the actual underlying? How, how do you explain it to yourself? And maybe yeah. they'd have an answer. Maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. Sure. Yeah, well, that, it gets back to, um, there's two, two more questions. I'll let you go. One, the ritual denunciation thing is, is fascinating because we saw people falling all over themselves in the last four years, not just in the world, but also in the church from, you know, these big organizations, evangelicalism, yeah. publishers. Um, and it feels like Russ Moore's just stick at this point is ritual denunciation. Um, right. it, it, what do you make of that in the evangelical ecosystem? Because I'm, I'm like <laughs> kind of conspiratorial. Um, and if you're a listener, you kind of know that. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm like, was this a, a Billy Graham thing? Was this, um, was this baked into the evangelical compromise uh, back in the fifties and sixties, like where, where, where is all this coming huh. from? Cause this is odd to me, like that they would just keep doing this, but it, it, it doesn't seem like it just came out of a vacuum. I mean, this seems like a tactical strategy that's been going on for a while. Yeah. So, um, it'd be interesting to think about the going all the way back to kind of Billy Graham era. The thing that I've thought about on this question more recently has been, um, about the, it's, it's Ren's positive, neutral, negative world. And it seems to me that in neutral world, you know, which is the, this is the, the, the multicultural pluralistic, um, let's everybody get at the table. You got all the different religions and ideologies there and make your case marketplace of ideas mentality. Um, that was kind of like lasted for about five minutes, but it was, you know, nineties through 2012, 2013, that's that kind of window that in, a, in that kind of environment, the currency that matters the most in terms of a seat at the table is your credibility. So credibility in that context, because it's like, how do you earn a seat at the table? Mm -hmm. How do you maintain a seat at the table? How do you maintain credibility with whoever's in charge of the table? And that nobody ever actually thinks about that. That like somebody actually is governing who's allowed. Certain people are not allowed at the table and certain people are, um, you, you know, and that's true of the Christian tables. And that's also true of the, like the larger American table or the Western table or whatever, which viewpoints are in and can be considered and are part of the, the discussion and which ones are not even allowed at the table. Right. Well, credibility is the main currency there. And so I think that the habit, the, the, the evangelical habit of like really caring about your credibility, at least approximately, I think it probably goes back farther to, you know, older, you know, 20th century, probably there's uh, precedents in history for this as well. But like in neutral world, credibility is your currency, which means anything that would threaten your credibility is a major threat because it's mm. how you're going to get removed from the table. Well, so what, what does that mean? Well, if, you, if somebody says, hey, you're you, but this person sounds like you and this person is not welcome at the table, you want to put some daylight between you and that person because you don't want to get kicked out of the table. Right. You, don't want to, you, don't, you don't want to lose your credibility with your audience. And so if your audience is sort of the liberal progressive, you know, the, the um, pr little progressive gaze on your shoulder, right? I wrote an article about that. You got to flick that guy off. But uh, if that's your audience, then credibility really matters. And so you get in the habit of distancing from different groups who threaten your credibility. 
and I think what's happening right now is that 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 we're in, a, in the transition from neutral to negative world as we're trying to develop what does mission strategy, what does evangelistic strategy look like in negative world. There's folks who are still operating where that credibility is the fundamental currency mentality. And so that's where, and, and the world knows it. And so that's the ritual denunciation thing. Mm. Let's, and, and the other thing, and, and the thing about it, the, the incentive structure has been discovered so that a guy like a Nick Fuentes, who from all accounts does seem to be like a, I've, I've never actually listened to anything you said or written <laughs> that it's all secondhand. What do I know? Maybe whatever. Um, but it sounds like he actually is like more of anti-Semitic and all that kind of stuff. So he's figured out though, that if he says something, he can piggyback. Right. And provoke the reaction, right? He can get the, he, and the ritual denunciation serves his purposes because it elevates him. Right. And, uh, and so, and so he's going to say something, he's going to say something legitimate and then he's going to tag along with whatever he really wants to say. Sure. And then you say the same thing he does, Christ is King. And now you have to denounce it lest you be thought that you're going to be, you're the Egyptian assassin. Right. Right. You're the anti-Semite. And if credibility is the currency, then you're going to be doing that all the time. And the world knows that's how they take that. How do you get them off message? Make them spend all their time telling you which Christians or non-Christians they're not like. We're not yeah. like that group. We're not like like MAGA. We're not like this. We're not like Moscow. We're not. And you're spending all your time doing that rather than saying, you know what? Call us what you want. This is what we're about. Yeah. And just leading with it and not not caring. Whereas so I, and I think the the thing that's the, the reason it's transition is I think in a negative world context courage is going to have a lot more currency like the, the willingness to like not actually buckle in fear of disapproval of worldly disapproval or of losing your seat at the table actually is a more powerful currency it's what it's it's a it's i wrote a book on courage because it's like a needed virtue in the moment and it's not just courage in relation to the outer world but courage in relation to other christians being willing to you know criticize and yet still regard them as brothers and i think that's the that's the thing right like I, we, we Mar, Moscow is critical of other groups, but we're critical of, of Christians, but they're, but we think they're Christians and we would welcome them to the table and we'd have them out here. Right. And that's that, that, and, and that's because there's a confidence. Like we think, we think we're being biblical. <laughs> like we, we're trying to be faithful and we're not threatened. Our credibility is not threatened. We torched that a long time ago. Like Doug right. made like the cornerstone of his ministry, right? Is this is the story he always tells is you know, he, he never wanted the suits and haircuts to show up and try to shrink wrap what was going on. And so anytime that was a danger, he would like blacken a tooth. He would, I, I got it. What's the thing I can say that's going to keep the suits and haircuts away. Um, now, even that, now that mentality can, he, uh, to be honest, there's a danger there because it can just become another form of steering. It's like, sure. okay, what outlandish thing can we get them to say in order to keep their, their teeth black? Right. Um, but as a general kind of like if you're not doing that at all, then you're probably going to be steered. Yeah. And I've noticed this. I mean, it was funny. I saw it was a few years ago now. Somebody offhand remark, a pastor said a lot of people are saying stuff today that they're going to be unemployable in 30 years, you know, based on yeah. what they're saying out loud. And I was like, I made a, a silly meme and it was like become unemployable. And it was like a guy riding a bull. And it yeah. was like, like, yeah. I don't, that's not my aim is to be employable in 30 years. I'm not, I'm not in a game to, right. you know, uh, and I, there is a place for credibility still. There is a right. play like we're yep. not dismissing the importance of reputation, but I think evangelicals have widely misunderstood uh, who our audience is, who we're aiming to please, who are worshiping right. and instead look to the world. My question just personally would be when I hear stuff like what Legan says and you see a pattern, I mean, he's not, he's largely responsible for a guy like Jamar Tisby getting a platform. He wrote the forward for Eric Mason's book. And, and you watch this pattern and now he's, you know, high up at RTS. My, my gut reaction is like, I don't want to invite him anywhere near my church. <laughs> I don't right. want, yeah. I don't want to read anything he's ever written. Uh, it's not, it's not necessarily canceled with culture. It's just like, I don't, I'm tired. I'm tired of, of trying to believe the best about what, what seem to be very keen operators, very uh, clinical, like calculated, talented, charismatic operators who, who don't, who aren't good faith. They, they talk about having good faith conversations on a podcast and they're anything but good faith. And so, um, how do I wrestle with that as a, just a pastor, as a man, when I hear the stuff and I'm like, I, I kind of just want to say, you know, I'm done with you, wash my hands, walk yeah. away. 
because right. uh, I, on, one, on one hand, I just don't have enough time to keep having all these voices that are kind of useless at this point. Right. But on the other hand, uh, it, it, there's a, a, an anger, a sense of betrayal hmm. when you get these guys that are high up in evangelicalism just totally missing it. They're not sons of a scar. They don't know the times. They're not speaking clearly or truthfully about what matters. They're not discipling on on clear things. And they're practicing this lobbying grenade, grenades indiscriminately, hypocritically. And I just am like, done. Like, I don't want anything yeah. to do with you. So how do you wrestle with that? Yeah, so I think that that the different, like, so put it in a very like stark, simple way. It's like, here I am saying, hey, we'd be happy to have Lee come out and speak at a disputatio at NSA. And you're going, I don't want league anywhere near my church. It's like, is one of those right and one of those wrong? And I would say, no, this is a, this is a, um, it's a strategic tactical kind of question. And it has to do with like where, like kind of where your community is. So, you know, as, as you, you know, um, are still kind of in the, what I would say is like early building phases of what you're doing there in Boulder, you are probably going to be more cautious about, Hey, wh what kind of foundation are we laying? Right for our community, which, and so therefore, which voices do I trust? This is where trust, credibility actually do matter. Um, who, who do I trust? Who do I come in? I saw a, um, this, as a, this is like a really, made me think of it. Michael Clary tweeted today about um, a, uh, a, 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 he was doing premarital counseling with a couple and the girl goes to his church and has for like a decade and the guy doesn't. And the guy thanked Michael, he said, because as we were getting married, I knew we were going to have some hard conversations about like manhood, womanhood. And I was, I was worried about these because I really liked her, but I was afraid when I started to say, here's what marriage looks like, that you'd get the typical kind of soft evangelical feminist resistance. And he said, every time he'd bring something up, she was like, yeah, that's it. And just, and so like his, this basically Clary was saying the discipleship that, that his church has done for this woman have prepared her well to be a husband and this guy recognize or to be married to this guy and to recognize it. So you're thinking I need to set up my structures and my influences in such a way that, that I can, I can have a solid foundation out here right now. Right. We Doug's been at this, like this, you know, Christ church is 40 plus years old. It's had the same pastor um, since, you know, you know, since the seventies and has, has a kind of real stable, you know, security foundation to where we're largely, you know, like we've still got the daily stuff going on and we will forever, but it's like, we're, ex we're in export mode. Well, part of that export involves inviting alternatives in order to come and then like bring the clarity. And so I just think there's a, like, we're at a different, there's a different place in terms of where this community's at that would enable us to be like, Hey, we can have that come and we are set up to do it. It's not going to be super disruptive. We have people come all the time. It's no big deal. Whereas I think a church in a different situation would go, Hey, we're still in like the, we're laying the, the foundation. And so therefore I'm going to be much more careful about what I pour into that foundation and who I point my people to as trustworthy, faithful yeah. voices for this present moment, because we're coming out of a season where, Oh, we were kind of confused about some stuff and we've, We've had to kind of reorient our ministry philosophy because what we were doing didn't work um, and wasn't wasn't is was missing a big piece. So I think that that's just it's a strategic like where's your community at kind yeah. of question. Um, and uh, and that like, you know, God willing, someday, you know, your your foundation set, your culture is solid. It's reproducing itself generationally. And now you're looking at like, all right, now beyond Boulder, you know, how do who can we bring in to try to, like, show the contrast to make it clear? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that's maybe this is a good place to, to kind of to, you know, one of the things I told um, Sean DeMars, the host of Room for Nuance, uh, when he invited me, I said, I'll come on and we can talk about the sin of nuance. Yeah, <laughs> because <laughs> on his podcast, called on his Room podcast, <laughs> um, which I think and I, and, I, and I think he was open to that. Like, like so I, I want to make sure that I say, like, my interactions with Sean and all this have been really great. Uh, I don't know him well, but like they've been really friendly. And, and I think he'd be willing. To, he's obviously not afraid of Moscow. But but part of the reason that I don't love the word nuance is because nuance, like empathy, is often selective. And so here, and the, and the interview was a good example. Like it was nuance to Keller, no nuance to Moscow. Right. Even the reconstructionists got nuance. They got the, they were well-intentioned, they were misguided, but it was an understandable reaction to the 80s and the cultural decay. And so the, even the, and, and uh, I mentioned that to Doug and Doug said, well, that's because they're dead. <laughs> like you could be all kinds of, you know, very generous to, uh, but back then there was no nuance for those guys. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and so nuance, some people get nuance, some people do not. And that's why I like the, the virtue that I've always commended 
as the like so if if you have empathy which is the um you know the the dangerous toxic sort of ver, you know version what's the virtue it's compassion right so i want to commend compassion and say empathy is not a, is not not where it's at right. similarly i think i'd want to say clarity is better than nuance right and the reason is is because clarity clarity gets you everything nuance does but gets you more so nuance um is you know, tends to want to make, uh, com- you know, if things are complicated, show how complicated they are. This isn't a simple question. Let's be nuanced. And it's like, that's great. Unless the question is actually simple. And right. then nuance is a distraction. Then you're just complexifying things that are really simple. Yeah. Uh, whereas clarity says, hey, the goal is simple things should be shown to be simple. Complex things should be shown to be complex. Just be clear. So I get everything that empathy that, that uh, nuance gives me, but I also get the clarity. And so that's what a lot of these sort of things do, I think, and, and why uh, I'm not offended. I, would, I still would love to someday sit down with Legan Duncan. I'd probably ask him about all this. Um, but in the end, I'm like, it's clarifying. And I would say to the and, and, I, and the thing I know, maybe his last word to the guys, I know that there's a lot of guys who are in up and coming in various circles around the country. Um, they're next gen leaders and they look and they they feel the ground shifting beneath the feet. And they're kind of like, ah, I don't know, you know, they're trying to figure it out. Yep. And I would just say, guys, you know, learn from these sort of moments. Like if, if you see like, ah, that was a big whiff, like l- have some courage and say so, like yep. have some courage and say like, Hey, I know what you were trying to do there, but that wasn't it. That was, you know, d- do it in the way the Bible says, encourage him as you would a father, but like, go ahead and say like, Hey, I just want to flag. I think that this was a whiff. I think that this was a mistake. Um, I think Rigney has a point. I think Wilson has a point. Like cultivate in yourself the courage to do that. Yeah. Knowing that there may be consequences, knowing that you may be unemployable someday, but but like learn to develop faithfulness where you're planted and don't simply get in the habit of muting yourself in order to kind of go along with the system. It's unhealthy and it'll lead you to bad, bad places. Agreed. Yeah. And I think, you know, part of it just honestly comes from, I don't know what mistakes Doug has made. Um, but everyone makes mistakes yep. in, in the course of the ministry There's natural human development. I've always been fascinated by even, you know, old dead guys and their theological yep. development over time and how their context shapes it. But, you know, we've, we bought, we bought hook, line and sinker, the missional kind of redeemer Keller model. We were promoting mm-hmm. all their books and just thought they were the greatest thing. And so there's a deep, almost like uh, a sense of regret. Like we, we, we brought uh, Jackie Hill Perry out you know, in 2018, 2019 to speak at our women's conference. And then she's out there promoting white fragility in 2020. And now I've introduced mm-hmm. my church to her teaching and I've got a bunch of people watching right. what she's promoting. And to, I was horrified. I was like, oh, this is my responsibility. This is my. Right. And so I think part of the reticence to, to cut, cut, cut. And people are looking at me like, well, who can I trust? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> right. Like, you know, I've got, I've got ladies in my church. are like, well, who should we read? And I'm like, at the Bible, like just read the Bible. I don't read, yeah. you know, cause I'm like, yeah. I, then, then I you're don't like read the old dead guys. Cause <laughs> yeah. we, we know they're not going to go woke. You know, like, yeah, like, right. like, <laughs> and that's kind of my temperament right now. And I think yeah. you're right. It's, it's more of a protective, like let's get everything aligned and let's set something settle and let's, cause we can at least go back to that. Cause there's almost like a, when leaders make mistakes, there's almost a mistrust of oneself where it's like, dude, right. if I was that misguided for, for that many years, yep. I don't know why people would listen to this podcast sometimes. Cause I'm like, gosh, it's like, um, right. you know, I, I, I want to trust the Lord and I want to trust where he's leading me yep. and where he's guiding me. Um, but it, 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 I think a lot of people are in my boat too, where they yeah. put a lot of stock in the TGC's, you know, um, credibility and they, and they feel betrayed or Christianity today or whatever it may be. And right. people are going, who can I trust? And I'm going yep. the Lord, uh, yeah, you right. can benefit from Doug, you know, and I, yeah. I trust right. Doug, but even, even my apprehension of other men at this point, it's not right. cynical. It's just more like they're humans. People make right. mistakes. Like everyone's, um, everyone's kind of scrambling. It's like, well, and people are always looking for like, well, who's infallible. Who's, who's yeah. not going to disappoint me? And it's like, everyone will disappoint you. <laughs> everyone. Jesus, man. The answer is Jesus. Why? <laughs> and it's where the, where the, why the Bible does do things like put not your trust in princes, put not your trust in men. Like it, right. that warning is meant to say like, there's a certain kind of allegiance and trust that belongs in one place and one place alone. Uh, and then at the same time, it says, and the God gave us teachers for our edification. And so you're like, well, which ones? Um, yeah. I do think that they're like one, maybe principle that could be helpful here is the kind of Gamaliel 
principle from the book of Acts. Like, you know, he's obviously not a Christian, but he gives some really good advice at that moment to that group whenever they're really ticked at the uh, disciples for preaching the gospel. Keep They won't shut up. And they want, they're enraged and want to kill him. And Gamaliel calms everybody down. And he says, hey, guys, remember, like this guy, Thutis rose up and gathered a following. And then he was killed and they scattered. And then this guy was, you know, gathered some followers and it was raised up and it was scattered. And this guy, you know, he like kind of gives these other examples of like basically revolutionary leaders who kind of made a name for themselves, the flash in the pan. And then it all tapered out. He says, so he's like, just give it some time. Like yeah. he says, hey, because he says this is. If it's of God, then you won't be able to stop it. And right. you don't want to oppose God. And if it's not of God, it'll take care of itself. Like it'll just peter out. And so there's a way in which like, especially in a time of transition and turbulence, like we're in right now, that like, um, it's okay to have a little bit of that apprehension, trust the Lord, seek to be faithful and be willing to make some mistakes. Right. So like, like don't like Paul, the apostle relied on Demas. Right. And then Demas apostatized. Right. Right. They like they uh, John Mark was in and then he left them and that Paul ended it. You know, so like there's these there, there's places where the, the scriptures them like David had close counselors betray him, his own kids. So like the story of like people, men are going to let you down is like runs through the scriptures. And it doesn't mean that they then say, don't trust anybody. Right. It means it means you trust, but you ultimately trust the Lord. And if someone proves to be unfaithful, it's like, all right, that's baked into the cake. Men, will, men are going to let us down. Let God right. be true, though every man's a liar. Amen. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Joe, uh, I'll put a link, obviously, to Lincoln's Legan's thing. Yeah. Um, and if uh, you write anything more on it, uh, you know, I'll put that too. I'll put a link to what's your, Great. do you know your Twitter handle off the top of your head? Yeah, it's Joe underscore Rigney. All right, I'll put a link to that. Anywhere else you want people to uh, to follow, subscribe, anything like that to promote? I'd what say you're doing? you know, no, no, nothing to subscribe. But if they want to go get uh, emotional sabotage while while they're still going going on, let's uh, now's now's the moment. So yeah, leadership. Well, we just mo picked sabotage. up a bunch of copies for uh, for our staff. We're going to read through it. So uh, so okay. yeah, thank you for writing that. Well, thank you for coming on the show today, Joe. Yeah, thanks. Hey, if you're a listener, subscribe, give this a great rating, share it with a friend. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Hope you did too. And if uh, you're interested, sign up on the Patreon. It helps me bring great content to you. You get a free sticker, free, uh, free mug. If you sign up for 15 a month, go over there in the show notes, sign up there, and we'll see you next time.